What I was going to start off by saying is uh, we're born with a question on our mind, and, and this question is, who am I? And this question is, has come in the last few years, I think in the last 30, 40 years, to predominate, that we really obsess culturally over this question of who am I? Where am I going? What am I doing? How, how am I made? And, and how we answer this question that is hardwired into our soul affects our impacts, our views on everything, on money, on relationships, on time, our goals, our hopes, our vocation, everything. And we are just so culturally obsessed with this question of who am, who am I that it dominates our, our dialogue. And what our society has said is that the way to figure out who you are is to navel gaze, to, to plumb deeply the well of your soul and see what's down there. Uh, in some ways, our culture has been paced by Ralph Waldo Emerson, who wrote, know thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Now, typically, it is said, if we're going to answer, who am I, that will enable us to answer the question of, who is God? Who am I comes first, some people say. Well, it's actually the reverse. To know ourself, we must first know our God. One of the poems that even atheists quote is a 19th century poem, and this, and this I think, shows how much we are preoccupied with God. One of them wrote, uh, Last night I sat upon a stair... I saw a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. Even if we don't believe in him, even if we wish he would go away, we cannot escape God's presence in this world and in our life. So if we're going to answer the question of who am I, we must first answer the question of who is God? That's what we're going to do this morning. The Bible gives us an incredible amount of information on this question of who is God. See, the Bible is not a book about humanity, although we're mentioned. The Bible is a book about God and his plan and, and how he redeems this world. The Bible does not spare details. If you study what other faiths teach, the Bible teaches us exponentially more about the Christian God than does, say, the Quran about Allah or the Hindu scriptures about their gods or the gods of the New Age movement who remain an inscrutable mystery. If we mastered what the Bible has to teach us about God, we would know more about God than we would our children, than we would our spouse. Pun intended, our God is a very open book. And one of the foundational things that the Bible teaches us about God is that God has existed and will exist for all eternity as three in one, a triunity, which we abbreviate to say a trinity. And the doctrine of the trinity, Charles Hodge says, underlies the whole plan of salvation. So if we get the trinity wrong, we get everything wrong, including this question of who am I? And what we see in John 14 is a very real description of the Trinity at work. We see Jesus, the Son of God who became flesh, was only a few days from going to, to the cross. And the disciples knew something was, something was going to happen, and they were concerned about what was to come. And Jesus assured them that although I'm leaving you for a while, that another one, another one like me, is coming. But for that one to arrive, I need to first speak with the Father. Here's what Jesus said. I'll ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. So here is the Trinity in operation. The Son asks the Father to send the Holy Spirit to be a helper to God's people. Three persons of one will, one substance, working together to redeem, to restore, to renew humanity. This is the Trinity. And this is where our core beliefs start. Our first core belief is who we believe God to be. Here's what we say. The triune God. We believe there is only one true, living, sovereign, holy, and eternal God. He exists in co-equal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each being a distinct person, but all of one essence, possessing the same nature, perfection and attributes. The triune God is the creator. He is the sustainer of all things. He is the source of all truth. He is worthy of worship, confidence, and obedience. So God is three in one. Three persons, but one substance. 
working in perfect unity to redeem, restore, and renew all things. By seeing this, we are standing with the church who has believed in this from the, her very birth. From the very birth of the church, the church taught and believed that God was three in one. Jesus himself said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you may be saying, well, okay, that's fine. But how does the Trinity answer the question of, who am I? Eric, how is this how is this practical? How is this more than simple philosophy that is interesting to talk about, maybe, but useful for our everyday life? The Trinity is the picture of what God desires his church to be. And the Trinity is the picture of what God desires us to show to a sinful and suffering world. First, the Trinity shows us that we can submit and we can serve without being made a subject or a subordinate. The other morning, uh, I was driving to church and the man in front of me pulled into the crosswalk and school was getting in and the school crossing guard very forcefully walked over to this man's car, told him to roll down his window, which, by the way, why do we do this to roll down your window anymore? <laughs> Does anyone have one of those cranks? You can't really do this, or it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't, but he did, he did this. And so, and so, the, and so the guy rolled down his window and he said, and, 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 the, and, and he told him he needed to move his car. And the guy in the car in front of me, he started yelling and I could hear him all the way inside my car. You're not the boss of me. You can't tell me what to do. Well, we don't like anyone telling us what to do. We don't like anyone being our boss these days. In 2012, submission means subjugation. Servanthood means subordination. The Trinity demonstrates that we can serve. We can submit without being made inferior. We tend to think of the triune God in this way. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all stacked up like a totem pole. You have the Father at the top. He's the one in charge. He really is God, or so we think. Then you have Jesus, and some mistakenly say, well, he's sort of like God. He's God light. He's in the second position, taking orders from the true God, from the real boss. And then you have the Holy Spirit at the bottom of the totem pole, and he takes orders from everybody. And some people even mistakenly believe that the Holy Spirit is God's muscle, kind of, kind of, kind of doing his bidding, but without any will of his own. Here's what the Bible really teaches. The Bible really teaches that the Father is not greater than Jesus. Jesus is not greater than the Holy Spirit. They are equally God. They are made of the same sum and made of the same substance. Light from light, true God from true God. Yet the Son takes direction from, voluntarily submits himself to the will of the Father. We see this here in John 14, where he asks the Father to send the Holy Spirit. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, not your will, but mine be done. And the Holy Spirit takes direction from the Father and the Son. Yet they are equal and very much each of them God. God has charged the church to show that we can serve, we can submit to one another without being a subject, without sacrificing our equality. Indeed, there is no more time when we demonstrate our greatness than when we serve. Matthew 23, Jesus said, The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. See, Jesus' obedience does more than just suggest that we can submit and serve. Jesus' submission to the will of the Father compels us to serve. Jesus summons us to submit. And there is no time when we are more like Jesus more time when we are likely to be exalted and honored than when we humble and we submit ourselves to the will of the Father. Excuse me one second. This thing is a problem this morning. It's a big, it's a big problem. Okay. Uh, Friday, I went to the Oasis, our homeless outreach in the West Bottoms, uh, where we have served 1,800 meals in the last year to homeless women and men. The ministry began when uh, Harlan Harper and Debbie Miser and others felt God's tug and they submitted. And as I watched Harlan and Polly and Eric uh, Nussel simply make themselves servants to these homeless men and women, bring them food, 
pick up plates, wash dishes, bring them gifts, have conversations where the men's haggard faces just lit up and they had, some of them had these, you know, incredible uh, toothless grins. I said to myself, this is their glory. This is their glory. They will never be more like Jesus than they are now, making themselves a servant. So let me ask you a question. How is God calling you to submit? Where is the Father telling you, be like Jesus? Be like Jesus. Second, in the church, community is king. Community is king. God's very being is community. God exists in community. And we are made to live in community too. God has created us to, to, to live in close kinship with others, to have relationships, deep, intimate, personal friendships forged in love and forged in grace. And there is, there is one way, there is one way that we know we are part of an authentic community. One litmus test. That is, we find ourselves in messes that we did not make. We find ourselves in other people's messes. You see, in our increasingly mobile and communications-driven culture, we have a lot of surface connections. Wafer-thin, uh, skin-deep, built on a gossamer thread. We rub up against a lot of people, Facebook friends, who can be defriended with a keystroke. And I have been is a metaphor for how we tend to approach people. Friendships seem disposable, and we throw them away like some greasy, grimy paper towel when that relationship becomes too messy. There may be nothing we do as a church more radical than inviting people into the mess that is our lives. And we share Jesus' love, and we share Jesus' grace in the messes we meet in the lives of others. Show me a church that is not messy, and I will show you a church that is dead, or a church that is dying. Now, some of the theologians here in our midst may say, well, Eric, are you saying really the Trinity is a messy relationship? Well, I don't think you can call it simple, mainly because of the human element. Remember, the, the human, Jesus Christ, also God, asked from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The very idea of a human being existing in the Trinity, as Jesus of Nazareth does, is far from simple. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, living in you and me, making his home in, in our sinful lives, is certainly messy. Regardless of any mess, what we cannot deny is the Trinity is this relationship of perfect love. What we're trying to do here at the Presbyterian Church of Stanley is to create a greenhouse to grow important, transforming, and yes, at times, messy relationships that help us grow in Christ. If we have no relationships in church, or if our greatest relationship is with the preacher and his wonderful sermons, although we preachers are very appreciative of that, we'll never become everything that Jesus wants us to be. Never. Now, some of you know uh, that I, I spent some time working for an African-American church in the inner city of Trenton, New Jersey. Not only was I uh, the only white person around, people, met, people that I met on the street thought that I was either an undercover cop or I was lost. Which, which, by the way, if you're planning to be an undercover cop and you're white in a black uh, your neighborhood, terrible cover. Horrible. <laughs> hor I don't know why anyone would ever do that. I, I was also with people who grew up in an entirely different background than me. I was raised in rural Missouri. The only cow these people had ever seen was cut into a patty between two pieces of bread. Yet I felt very much at home. I felt like I was part of a family. And it was often messy. I said things sometimes that I shouldn't have said. There were a lot of awkward silences where people tolerated what that white guy just said. And they said things to me 
that, that could have easily been misinterpreted. But Jesus held it all together. And this is what Jesus envisioned his church to be. More than simple unity of mind, more than threadbare diversity. The first picture of the church we receive is on Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this, this the, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and they were astonished. And they said, are not all these speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and and, and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, um, Egypt, and other parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabians. We hear them telling in his own tongue the mighty works of God, and all were amazed, and they were perplexed. The Bible is so clear on this multiple times. Our community, our common unity comes from one place. It comes from the Holy Spirit. We believe, we trust, we cast our hopes with the Holy Spirit at the Presbyterian Church of Stanley. The Holy Spirit is very, very important to us at the Presbyterian Church of Stanley. In fact, I would say it is his pervasive presence that sets us apart from other churches. That's one of our core beliefs. We believe the Holy Spirit is God. He is co-equal. He is co-existent with the Father and the Son. He is our divine helper, convicting us of sin, regenerating and sanctifying us so we might transform the world. The Holy Spirit indwells every believer and empowers every believer to live a godly life. Who is God? Who is God? You know, none of us have ever met God the Father. And I doubt that any of us have ever met God the Son. If I said to you, hey, guess who I ran into at CVS last night? Jesus of Nazareth. You would have me committed. Yet many of us feel like we know God. And many of us feel like we really love God. Why? We know the Holy Spirit. As Jesus promised, he's been sent to be our helper. Well, we may say, well, help us to do what? Well, members of the body of Christ, we get benefits. We get benefits. John Calvin put it like this. He said, the Holy Spirit is God's testimony that is engraved on our heart. And he went on to say, the Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ unites us to himself and by which we come to enjoy Christ and all his benefits. Well, what are those benefits? There's a lot of them. Let me give you a partial list, partial, taken from God's word. God's word teaches us that the Holy Spirit creates, that he rests upon, that he fills with power, that he speaks, he carries, he picks up, and sets down again. He instructs, he admonishes, he renews, he leads, he gathers together, he brings justice. What are the Holy Spirit's benefits? Scripture teaches us that he blesses, he grieves, he raises us to our feet, he descends, he drives out demons. He teaches you what, what at the time you should say. He gives life. He testifies. He enables. He fills with joy. He sets us free. He makes us cry, Abba, Father. He groans. He intercedes. He confirms our conscience. He searches all things, even, even the deep things of God. What are the Holy Spirit's benefits? He lives in us. He justifies. He gives gifts. He sets God's seal of ownership upon us. 
He rebirths and renews. He sanctifies. He acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh. He agrees in his testimony with the water and the blood. And the Holy Spirit says, come. So, who is God? God is someone who does not teach us how to be. God is someone who does not impart some secret wisdom about who he is. He himself lives within us, transforming us, making us a part of his community, the community of the triune God. Let that, let that settle in for a second. He makes us a part of his community, the community of the triune God. Who am I? I am someone who is made to be one with God. I am someone who can never be all that I have been made to be without God and without the people of God. Another poem puts it this way. Last night I saw upon a stair God descending, building from thin air. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he called to me, his beloved, I will always be.